Welcome to the Dinosaur George podcast, a show about paleontology and other earth sciences. Dinosaur George is a public speaker, author, and TV host with 30 years of study in paleontology. He has performed live in over 4,500 events across the US and Canada. Now, here is Dinosaur George. Hey, good morning, everybody. If it's morning, wherever you are, it it is where I am. So good morning to you. This is podcast, I think, number 133. This one's going to be fun. Of course, I have fun in all of them. I say that all the time, but that's because I enjoy doing them. But uh, this particular one, the subject today is really cool. I got a chance to interview a, uh, a PhD student from Australia who is going to talk about fanged kangaroos <laughs> yeah kangaroos that that used to have fangs called a fangaroo i'm telling you the word fangaroo has now become my all-time favorite word <laughs> and it's the one i think i'm going to use the word the most but uh fangaroo uh, the fang kangaroos is really pretty cool and i really i i really <laughs> enjoy just saying the just saying the name so in the interview She's going to talk about these fang kangaroos and a little bit about some of the other animals that lived in Australia. It's a very exciting interview. She's very pleasant, a lot of fun. Um, I had a little bit of audio trouble with the connection, which is sort of upsetting. But, you know, what What can you do? It's it's as good as technology has. And But anyway, there's just a few times where, where her voice kind of breaks up a little bit, but, but not too terribly bad. 99% of the interview went great. Uh, for everybody out there, we fixed the issue on the website now. If you want to submit a question uh, for the Ask Dinosaur George segment, you go to the website, dinosaurgeorge.com. Click on the Contact Us uh, tab at the top on the right-hand side, I believe. And when you click on Contact, you'll see Contact, you'll see a couple of things, and you'll see the Ask Dinosaur George uh, page. Click on that, and then very simple, just your name, where you're from, and then your question. So we fixed all of that stuff. It's easier, it works better, and I can actually get it now. Some of you have started using it, and uh, we've. so I'm going to answer those questions uh, today on, on this episode. So what we're going to do is we're going to listen to the interview um, that we had, and then when we come out of the interview, I'll go straight into the Ask Dinosaur George segments. But something that, um, uh, first of all, for everybody listening, on the podcast. Thank you all very much for for joining me and I hope you enjoy it. For those of you that are watching on YouTube, I've got something in my hand that is crazy cool. It is the foot claw of an Acrocanthosaurus. You know, that's a dinosaur I don't talk much about and I should because he is just so cool. But it's a foot claw from an Acrocanthosaurus. Now, We sell replicas on our website at store.dinosaurgeorge.com. And if you're interested in something like this, the reason why we sell, well, we sell replicas for two reasons. One, because it doesn't deplete the resources. There are some fossils that are very, very common, and I don't see anything wrong at all with, with selling them and trading them, and I don't see anything wrong with that at all. Some fossils, much more scientifically important And so those fossils are the ones that I don't sell. I just, I choose not to because I think they serve a better role uh, being available for study. So on those important fossils, we make um, uh, replicas of them. We pour a mold of them. So when you get a replica claw from us, you're not getting something sculpted or, or made up. You're getting an actual mold. And what that means is you're going to see all the flaws that are on the original piece. So, if you want to collect something cool, uh, like if you were trying to buy the Acrocanthosaurus toe claw that I'm holding up right now, if this was the authentic claw, you might be looking at ten, fifteen thousand dollars for something like this. But I think on our website, it's something like twelve or thirteen, something. I don't know. But anyway, um, I'm going to play just a short um, commercial about our replicas, and then we'll come back. Uh, we'll come back and do that. Um, uh, do that interview. So anyway, I hope you guys enjoy the interview. It's a lot of fun doing it. So uh, let's go in here and see if uh, we can listen to it. You're gonna you're gonna enjoy it a lot, I think. Oh. 
Would you like to buy fossil replica skulls, teeth, claws, and more? Then visit our catalog at store.dinosaurgeorge.com. We sell replicas rather than real fossils so that we don't deplete the resources. Our replicas and casts are museum quality and look real, but are much more affordable. From dinosaurs to ice-aged mammals to modern animal skulls, there is something for everyone. Visit our online catalog at store.dinosaurgeorge.com and start your collection of amazing fossil replicas today. All right, let's jump straight into the interview. I think you guys are going to enjoy it. Here we go. Is there anything more recognizable than a kangaroo? I mean, anyone that sees a kangaroo immediately, we may not know the species, but we know a kangaroo when we see them. Well, our guest today might give us some insight into some prehistoric kangaroos that may not look the way we think of kangaroos all the way from the University of Queensland School of Earth and Environmental Sciences, PhD student Kayleen Butler. Miss Butler, welcome to our show. Hello, George. It's lovely to meet you. Oh, it's such a pleasure. Now, with that accent, you were not born in Australia. You must have lived in Texas, right? <laughs> um, it's actually, I get that a lot, but I was actually born in Australia. Uh, for some reason, I tend to slur my R's a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, you, you're speaking too clear to be from Texas. If you were from Texas, I wouldn't have understood anything you just told us. <laughs> Con- <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> con- consider yourself, you are now an official Texan. We've just adopted you. <laughs> Excellent. So <laughs> before we before we hop into the subject, and did you notice how I just injected hop? That was, was that ingenious? Yes, that yes was, I did. Nice work. That was a genius. <laughs> I am stunned at myself. So before we hop into the subject that we're on today, l- uh, tell us a little bit about you. Uh, so I'm a PhD student at the University of Queensland. Um, I am just finishing up my PhD at the moment, actually. Um, it's under examination at the moment. Uh, so fingers crossed. But uh, I got into paleontology uh in reality, because I decided to tell Jurassic Park. Um, And then I decided that I was definitely going to study dinosaurs. And I I went all the way through high school saying, I'm going to be a paleontologist. And I got to university and I still love dinosaurs, but I just become really fascinated with Australian marsupials and how special and unique they are. So I ended up uh, talking to some people at the Queensland Museum, talking to some people at the university, and in the end, I ended up studying these really cool little kangaroos that I work on now. What a what a cool journey to get to where you're going. And before I forget, yeah. let me let me tell you, congratulations. I realize you're not across the finish line yet, but I look forward to when we have you back referring to you as Dr. Butler. But uh, let me congratulate you yeah. now on the work. How difficult is it? Because I don't know if a lot of people understand what it takes to become a PhD. What? How difficult is that? Um, it's a very long process. It can be really exhausting at times. I, I found it very rewarding. I really did enjoy it quite a bit. Um, but there are times when you are exhausted and it's a lot of work. You have to um, effectively, you have to publish three or four papers in that time period. Uh, there's a lot going on. You're not just working on your PhD. You're often tutoring and doing something else as well. So it can be a really long process. Yeah. Um, I've it only took me uh, three and a half years, though, which is on the, the better side of things. I know people that have taken up to seven years to finish their PhD. Wow. That's that's very impressive. That That is a very, yeah. that's an imperi- a very impressive driving force behind you and good for you. Uh, good for science. I mean, science is fortunate to have yeah. people like you in it. So good. So let me ask Thank you, you. Do, do you get any opportunity to go out and do actual excavation is your focus mostly been um the education side or have you had any opportunity to do some of the hands-on stuff out in the field uh so i like to refer to myself as a museum paleontologist uh i'm one of those people that uh was very fortunate in that most of the specimens i needed were already sitting in a museum prepared and ready to look at and I actually worked on over 2,000 kangaroo specimens Whoa. in my PhD. Yeah, um, all from one little site in northern Queensland called the Riversley World Heritage Area. But uh, 
those kangaroos were already there. They'd already been found because there's been a lot of work done on that site already. So I didn't even get a chance to visit the site during my PhD, which was a little bit unfortunate. I'm hoping to go next year. Uh, but I have done some field work at other sites in Queensland, and I've really enjoyed what I did do. I just haven't had much of a chance to get out there because I already had those specimens, so there right. was no uh, funding reason for me to go. Right. Yeah. But once you get your PhD, do you have an idea yet of your focus of your career? Will you be a teacher? Will Do, do you have any ideas at this point? Yep. Yeah, um, I'm interested in teaching and I'm also interested in uh, general academic research as well. So um, a lecturing position would be excellent, but uh, we'll see where we end up. Yeah. Right. So for any of you listeners out there, especially those of you in Australia, we have a very good following in Australia, by the way, for all of you out there, uh, how neat would it be to one day walk up to Dr. Butler, who will be your teacher and say, I heard you Mm -hmm. on a podcast X amount of years ago. That's uh, I I hope that happens. And I wish you the very best in in your career. That would be cool. So now let's talk about. How well? First, how I found Miss Butler, and is it okay if I call you Kayleen? Is that okay? Yes, Kayleen is fine. Okay, and for all of you listeners, the reason why I wanted you to know why I asked that is because I've said this time and time again. Um, if uh, Miss Butler, if Kayleen had her degree, is, was a doctor, I would be referring to her as Doctor Butler, and and not by her first name. And I would ask if it's appropriate to call her that. It's the same way when you meet somebody. For any of you young people, especially those of you that live in Australia, that may get a chance to to meet you somewhere. Um, it's it's certainly it, there's it's it's more appropriate to refer to somebody or miss as Mister or Mrs. or Miss um, or Doctor. But I'm gonna since you gave me the okay, I'm gonna call you Kayleen. But for everybody out there that's the appropriate way to address people if it's somebody that you've that you've not met okay so now let's get into this oddity the way i learned about you and about your work i was reading a scientific paper and i see this headline about a fanged kangaroo those two words do not go together for the average person so i was amazed and thought okay I got to talk to this person who was studying about this. So tell us about this fanged kangaroo. So there's actually an entire family of fanged kangaroos. Uh, The family's name is Balboridae. Uh, They're somewhat closely related to Macroprotidae, which includes all of the kangaroos that you think of, like your red kangaroos that everybody will know and your tree kangaroos. Uh, But Balboridae is really interesting because... Uh, most representatives of the family seem to have these really large canine teeth at the front that look like uh, look like really long fangs. So what's strange about these guys is that they were actually herbivores because the front teeth don't actually tell you about diet. It's the back teeth that tell you. Uh, so uh, what we do know is that these guys were herbivores, but they still had these weirdly large canines. Uh, the best species of these guys is actually named Balbaroo Fangaroo. So that's where the fanged kangaroo ne- ca- name comes from as well. Did you just say Fangaroo? Yes, Balbaroo <laughs> Fangaroo is the official species name of the first species of fangaroo to be described. What yep. an amazingly cool name. <laughs> Boy, couldn't describe it. Really it really is. That's so cool. Fangaroo. Yeah. That has um, now it, become it was, my favorite word. <laughs> it's amazing. Yeah. Um, it was named by a man called Bernie Cook, who did uh, pretty much all the groundwork research that I uh, do is based on his research. Um, yeah, it's it's an amazing name. <laughs> That's cool. So so you mentioned the family that they're from. Um, yeah. Uh, the uh, Balbarid, uh, Balbarids, is that a Balbarid? Balbarids. Okay. Balbarids, yeah. So is there something distinctively different that separates them from the modern kangaroos or are they, do they look almost the same? Uh, aside from the canines, they look very much like, uh, so there's, there's something called a rat kangaroo. Uh, that's another family again. Their family is Hypsoprimnodontidae. Uh, 
they look very much like those. Uh, they didn't actually hop. They were actually uh, animals that were either on four legs scurrying or climbing trees. Uh, it, there's a little bit of research to suggest that they did, in fact, climb trees as well. But uh, hopping hadn't evolved yet in both the ancestors of modern kangaroos that were around at the same time as these guys and in the fang kangaroos. So th they're kind of somewhere between a kangaroo and a possum in terms of their appearance, but they were actually very tiny. They're, the biggest uh, body mass estimate that we have for one was around 10 kilograms, which if you can imagine the big red kangaroos that you think about today, that's really quite small. Wow. You know, one of the things living here in the United States, we, we of course, see kangaroos in, in um, uh, zoos, but I never realized how many yeah. or how much of a variety there are, because we always assume there's sort of yeah. two kangaroos, big ones and little ones. But exactly. Yeah. So um, There's over 70 species of kangaroo oh. that are uh, considered extant. Yeah. Um, so there's things like tree kangaroos. Uh, we get them up in northern Queensland and in Papua New Guinea. So another misconception is that there aren't any kangaroos outside of Australia. In fact, there are some in Papua New Guinea as well um, that are native to there. Uh, so those tree kangaroos uh, live up in rainforest and they – actually do climb trees and they're absolutely beautiful uh, we have little tiny wallabies when you think people often think of a wallaby as something that is completely unrelated to a kangaroo and just right. kind of looks like it right um, but in fact wallabies and kangaroos are effectively all kangaroos yeah um and then there's uh, tiny little things like um, I'd strongly recommend anybody who's interested Google quokkas. They are probably the most adorable kangaroo you'll ever see. People like to take selfies with them. It's become quite a trend in Australia, um, like quokka selfies. Um, so there's such a range of diversity within kangaroos themselves. They're absolutely fascinating. Yeah. Now, can you spell what that quokka or whatever you said? Do you know how to, how to spell that for everyone? Yeah. Um, so it's Q-U-O-K-K-A. That sounds so cool. Just the names are yeah. so awesome. The name, um, they, they basically just always so happy that they've become like a, an adorable phenomenon for some <laughs> Australians. Yeah. <laughs> That's so cool. Now, you had mentioned yeah. that the fangs of these kangaroos or these kangaroo relatives yeah. um, are not, don't indicate uh, diet. Are you able to tell that exactly. by the wear pattern on them or the shape or how do you come to that conclusion? Um, so you can arguably look at the wear pattern to see that there's no uh, wearing on the teeth consistent with food. But in reality, that conclusion comes from what we know about modern animals. Uh, in fact, uh, the front teeth very rarely tell you about diet in all mammals. It, it's the back teeth, so the molars, that actually tell you about diet. And those molars are very similarly shaped to uh modern kangaroos like tree kangaroos, for example. So they seem to be most consistent with browsers. Now, people often get tripped up because they say, well, if something has a large canine, doesn't that mean that it's a carnivore, like a lion, for example, or a saber-toothed tiger is the most common example. Um, the reality is that there's actually a species of deer called the musk deer. Uh, the skull is about the, it's about 10 to 13 centimeters long. It's not a particularly large skull, but the canine is huge. And if you Google this deer, it often is referred to as a vampire deer. Um, in that case, uh, it's just the males that have that really large canine. They're used uh, somewhat for fighting and somewhat as like a uh, sexual dimorphism, which is where uh, the males have one feature that the females don't, and that's how you tell them apart. Um, but yeah, uh, it, the canines actually really don't tell you much about diet because they can have other functions other than eating. Um, so a very, very straight canine is often related to a kind of grabbing motion, but that's not always true either. If you think about saber-toothed cats, for example, they have those very long uh, curved canines, and that doesn't mean that they're actually just uh, there ornamentally. They do hypothetically use them. Yeah. Wow. So – did your research well first are you able to distinguish between male and female of the little fangaroo that you studied and are the fanged teeth only found in one of the two sexes so that's the real problem with why this is a hypothesis more than anything else we do know that these teeth weren't being used to eat that's very evident but the issue is 
with 2,000 specimens, somehow uh, the nose region of the skull is rarely ever preserved. Wow. So we can't actually, for a single species, sit down and get, uh, first of all, good body size measurements that suggest that there are two size classes in the same species, which is common when you have a male and female in kangaroos. Um, we can get that, but we because there's some overlap, we can't quite tell if you know the males had fangs and the females didn't because we just don't have enough samples where we have the front of the nose. Uh, take fangaroo, for example, where there are dozens of specimens, but in fact, uh, only one of the skulls actually has the front of the nose preserved with the canine in it. We wow. often will get uh, like the alveoli where the canine sits in, the little hole in the jaw, right. um, in the skull, I mean, but we don't typically get uh, the canine preserved, which has been a, a big problem. So we do know that they all had these canines, but if the females had smaller canines, it's very difficult to tell. There is one species of fanged kangaroo where the canine, uh, the only canine we have for it is a bit smaller, but otherwise it's uh, almost identical to Balvaru fangaroo. So uh, that's the strongest evidence we have that perhaps that one was the f a female representative because it is one of the smaller skulls uh, of that species. But once again, it's, it's insane that you can have so many specimens and still have these huge questions that just you can't answer with the sample size that you have. Boy, that's impressive, though. But, you know, it really drives yeah. home the, the, the difficulty paleontologists face, and that is... Exactly. Yeah. I mean, if it wasn't for the few that you had, who would be hypothesizing that a kangaroo ever had, or a relative of a kangaroo, ever had fangs at all? I mean, you would... The exactly, average yeah. person would look at it and go, that's kangaroo, and leave it at that. Yeah, yeah. Um, some uh, some potteroids, so uh, some of the smaller kangaroos do sometimes have canines, but uh, those canines are not the size that you would see in something like kangaroo, not at all. Uh, so you wouldn't imagine it. It's And it becomes very much like that in the fossil record, even just in kangaroos, for example. You don't imagine that there is this little herbivorous kangaroo that has huge fangs, but you also wouldn't imagine that at the same time there is a kangaroo that may have been carnivorous. Uh, and there's also a kangaroo later in the fossil record that uh, one of the biggest kangaroos to ever exist actually had a really short, squished face that looked um, completely different to what you would expect for a kangaroo. Uh, so it, the fossil record is so diverse and it's just amazing uh, that you can find specimens like this that tell you something that you would just, you would never expect would have existed unless you actually had a photograph of it or you physically held it in your hand. Uh, that's something I really love about paleontology, to be honest. Oh my God. Now uh, uh, you, you brushed over something and I, my jaw hit the table. Did yeah. you say there was evidence of a possible yes. carnivorous kangaroo? Yes. Um, no so way. The, the, the big thing that often happens is if the news gets hold of the two separate stories, they'll mix them together um, and say that fangaroo is a carnivore, but right. actually there's a separate family. Um, so those rat kangaroos that I was talking about earlier, the hypsoprimnodontids, are... Uh, there's actually two groups of them that existed around the same time as fanged kangaroos. So this is around 25 to 10 million years ago. Uh, there was the ancestors of the only living species of hypsoprimnodontid, which is the musky rat kangaroo. Uh, but then there was also this other group that has uh, back teeth that would be consistent with something you'd expect to be eating meat. Um, but they also... Uh, the skull in general, there's been a lot of research done that suggests that it does seem to be more consistent with carnivores. Uh, so there does seem to be one species that, if nothing else, was at least an insectivore, but definitely had some carnivorous tendencies, yes. Um, wow. And some modern kangaroos are omnivorous. So some things, uh, some potteroids, uh, some of the little potteroo animals, and some uh some tree kangaroos are actually uh, omnivorous, but they, they don't tend to be meat eaters right. uh, so much as, you know, they will eat insects and eggs and things like that. Having said that, there is a paper that recently came out, which was really cool, uh, that talks about modern wallabies. And in fact, a wallaby will eat meat. Uh, it's not their preferred tendency, but if they need the protein, they will actually scavenge. Yeah. Wow. Um, so even modern kangaroos can eat meat. They just uh, typically don't. Yeah. 
So we used to think of kangaroos as these lovable animals, but you're destroying the, our image of kangaroos. <laughs> oh, I like to think that kangaroo would still be adorable and lovable. He's still a little tree, tree leaf eating thing that scurries around. Yeah. With- um, but yeah, it's it's really interesting. Um, it's it's very much true of like there's a photo somebody had um, that was going around the internet for a while of a deer eating meat. Um, most herbivores, in reality. Uh, if, if they need food, they will do what they have to, and they will scat, like eat, eat carry on. So right. things that have died. Yeah. I re- um, it's, it's very rare though, but I- that paper just really fascinated me because I do like to say, well, there was a carnivorous kangaroo and people never believe it. So it's my new example. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, I, I watched a video of a hippopotamus come out of the water, walk up to the carcass of a water buffalo and just take an enormous hunk yeah. out of it. And it, had I not yeah. seen it, I wouldn't have believed it. But, you know, I've seen, yep. we, we raise cattle, and I've seen cows chewing on bones. And I made the assumption yeah. it may be for calcium, but it, it, it may be, again, like it like you said, it may be more common when necessary than, than we think. Yeah. That's impressive. Yeah, it's an opportunistic thing, I think. Yeah. Now, did your little fangaroos, you, you mentioned, if I understood correctly, they're not hoppers. They're kind of yeah. scurriers. Did, yeah. Did, did hopping evolve out of environmental need or a need to flee predators is there anything in the fossil record that would shed any light on why why kangaroos ultimately go to a hopping motion instead of a running motion yeah um so there's a lot of uh gaps in the fossil records after around 10 million years which is a bit disappointing because that is when hopping seems to have begun to evolve but uh one hypothesis is uh, environmentally related. You see, uh, around the time the fanged kangaroos went extinct, uh, you were starting to see the expansion of open woodland and eventually grassland. So you were you were getting these wide open spaces. Um, hopping is not efficient if you live in a rainforest environment, which is basically what northern Queensland was until very recently it was rainforest, um, until around 10 million years ago. So it does look like the expansion of that open grassland did uh, somewhat allow for the potential for hopping to evolve. Now, the exact drivers of why that evolved are still something that's very much being studied and very interesting. But uh, it, the environment itself does explain why it was possible. Wow. Yeah. Man, what a what an amazing thing to demonstrate how animals are so closely associated with the environment. Yeah. You know, we see it here in North America where as as forests gave way to the open yeah. grasslands, you get these sprinters and these runners and hooved animals seem to explode yeah. and so that that's always fascinating. Yeah. Now, I also read in an article that that referenced your study if I understood correctly, have you discovered that these little fang kangaroos may have lived more recently? In other words, the way the average person would look at it is, is we see that you describe that little fang guy and I would believe he must be way back there because modern kangaroos look so different and it took a long time to get there. But did yeah. your study show he's a little more recent than what others may have assumed? Yeah, so um, previously, the we, we had a record of Balberids around, specifically at my site, we had a record of Balberids from around 25 million years to around 15 million years. And that's based on biostrategic and some radiometric dating of a couple of the sites. Uh, so it, it seems like they had gone extinct at a really interesting time period uh, something called the uh, Miocene Climatic Optimum, which is when uh, the Earth becomes the warmest it was in the Miocene. And it looks like their extinction was directly related to this increase in temperature and shifting climate. But in fact, sound specimens uh, uh, from a site doesn't have a lot of specimens to start with, but it's later. It's around 10 to 12 million years old. So the 5 million year um, time period in which Balbara still existed after this uh, 
major climatic change that was hypothesis to correlate hypothesized to correlate with their extinction. So that's quite interesting because that suggests that uh, that couldn't be the only thing that drove the bellbirds to extinction. Although it does seem to have had an effect on their numbers, there was a decline in diversity at that time based on my new research. But they didn't go extinct then; they went extinct around five million years later. Oh wow! Yeah. Wow. Well, you mentioned how you you got interested in in some of the life that, of course, is there in Australia. And it seems that Australia, and I guess like so many other places, there always seems to be a gigantic member of all the different groups. There always seems to be giant members. Did you have you had a chance? Now, I realize this isn't the focus of your study. But yeah. just from your own interest, are there examples of some of the things in Australia that either grew to gigantic proportions compared to modern or maybe were much smaller compared to modern? Are you aware of any of those? Yeah. Um, so for for a start, the earliest kangaroos, all of them, most of the kangaroos, more the size of a little pottery um, for anybody interested in looking up potteries. Yes, uh, actually, a time period uh, and in the Pleistocene. Right. Um, the exact uh, it is a little bit uh, thousand years ago, fifty thousand years ago. Uh, until then, there were representatives of many families. So the kangaroos that made it to have been over two meters. Um, had a very long bombard, but they were called diprotodon. Uh, those were, uh, their weight could be estimated in tons. They were wow. so large. And we actually have these really cool things that uh, don't have any modern relatives left, uh, but are kind of related to koalas and wombats that once again were carnivorous, called the marsupial lion. So they're actually something that looked very much like a lion. They seem to have had some tree climbing ability, but uh, they were actually a marsupial creature, and that was kind of the the top predator around that time period. Now, all of this megafauna that existed then went extinct, uh, but there's actually two conflicting hypotheses, so it's uh, uh, kind of an interesting topic for another day as to why those guys went extinct, yeah. Boy, but you know what? We'd love to have you back when you become Dr. <laughs> Dr. Butler, when you yes. become Dr. Butler, would love to have you back to talk more. I find the Australian megafauna amazing. I have a yeah. um, a replica of, of um, uh, oh, what's his name? The giant Komodo-ish guy. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, Megalania. Megalania. Thank yes. you. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, I find yeah, um, that So we be. also had giant Komodo dragons as well. Wow. Yes. That's disturbing. That thing is, yeah. that, that's the thing of nightmares when you see pictures it of that is. animal. They're terrifying. And um, most people will say that about most of the pictures you show them of megafauna. Everything is huge. We had really large birds as well. Um, it's just a really interesting time period in the fossil record. It's it's kind of, yeah. Um, so the time period that I work on is really interesting because it's where all the marsupials are starting to diversify. And then I'd say the next most interesting period in the time period in the fossil record is actually that period where we get all the megafauna and then they become extinct. And the question is why? And so there's uh, a lot of debate about that. Yeah. Is it, is it frustrating as a scientist or as exciting as a scientist that you can't get your hands on every answer right now? It's a little bit of both. I'm very frustrating when people uh, start asking why and expect to have all the which is misconception about science. Um, but it's having said it's a lot of fun to not know everything because it means that for we all have something to do. Uh, we all still have research. But it's just really it means that we, we keep being able to find new information. And every time we find new information, that does change our understanding. It's very much the fang kangaroos are an excellent example of that. We thought they went extinct at a certain time period, but in fact, they didn't. And that completely changes our understanding of kangaroo evolution at that time period. So uh, it's just when you find an extra specimen and it answers an extra piece of a puzzle, it's just a really, uh, it's an amazing feeling. And uh, 
as frustrating as it is to not be able to answer every question with a, yes, we definitely know this um, positive response, it's still um, – it's still very satisfying when you do actually find that answer or when somebody does uncover some more specimens that have a skull and maybe we can look at whether or not the males and females differ. That could be something that's really exciting as well. So I'm looking forward to that hopefully happening. How exciting. Well, I got to yeah. tell you, this has been this has been a lot of fun because I've never in my life thought I'd be speaking to somebody about something called a fangaroo but this is, that's not my favorite yeah. word now. Fangaroo, I'm going to use fangaroo. I got to figure out ways <laughs> to incorporate fangaroo into, into everything I say. <laughs> I like it. Yes. That's so um, cool. I, I, I've been accused of that, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> well, she is a PhD student at the University of Queensland School of Earth and Environmental Sciences in beautiful Australia. Miss, but soon to be fer- referred to as Dr. Kayleen Butler. What a great pleasure it was to talk to you. I had such a good time. I hope you enjoyed this. I did. Thank you so much. And we definitely would love to have you come back again. We'd like to, you know, when when you finally get over that finish line and you're doctor, uh, and anytime you're studying something that, that you find fascinating, boy, we'd love to hear from you because we'd love to get you back on again. I know my listeners are yeah. going to, everybody's going to go Google you to see who you are because I know they're as excited okay. about the <laughs> subject as, as I am. I, I'm, I'm thrilled with it. I'm thrilled to read your work and I, 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 I wish you absolutely the, the very best of luck in everything in your career and everything. Thank you so much. All right, man, that was pretty cool, wasn't it? I told you it was going to be. I told you it was going to be a good interview, man. She was a lot of fun, and I wish her the very best in her career. Can't wait for her to become a doctor. So uh, that was a great interview, and it was like I said, I enjoyed it immensely, and I hope you guys enjoyed it as well uh, because it was really, really cool. All right, let's uh, let's jump into the Ask Dinosaur George segment. I know a lot of you have been writing, so I went through and and pulled some of them. So let's jump right into that, okay? It's time to ask Dinosaur George. In this segment, George answers your questions about paleontology. If you would like to leave a voice message, call us at 210-888-9077. This is not a toll-free call, so children, please ask your parents' permission. If you would like to submit your question in writing, go to dinosaurgeorge.com and click the Ask Dinosaur George page. Questions are chosen at random and we clear all messages monthly. So if you have a question about paleontology, Ask Dinosaur George. All right. Thank you, lovely lady who does the voiceover for us. That's very kind of you. All right. Let's jump in here. Uh, This first question is from Kenneth said, hello, Dinosaur George. My name is Kenny Fish. Hey, Kenny, what a pleasure to have you write to me. Thank you so much. I just want to begin with how much I really respect you and what you do. Hey, that's very kind of you, uh, Kenneth. Really, it is. Um, He said, I'm not in the professional field anymore, but I still dabble. Isn't that the coolest thing? Isn't that the greatest part about this, this this whole thing about science, Kenny, is it doesn't matter if it is a career, if it used to be a career, if it's going to be a career, It's just so cool that we can all share in something that we all like. He said, okay, I love the respect you give each and every person and the passion in which you do it. Well, that's very kind of you. Thank you. Uh, You know, Kenny, one of the things that I'm very proud of is the listeners and the viewers, uh, the best people in the world. You know, we we can all disagree. We can all uh, have a debate. That's That's the essence of science is to be able to sit down and have a conversation to converse with one another, to stand on a soapbox and scream what you believe and not be willing to even listen to someone else is a detriment to science. Now, uh, certainly when you get to the point where uh, you you can't, uh, it, it's, an, it's a non-debatable topic. Like if somebody wanted to argue that oxygen doesn't exist, well, you can't and you won't give them the same amount of, of time and effort because you're just not going to win the argument. But when it comes to other things, it's the best thing to do is to talk about it. So thank you. That's very kind. OK. And he says, my question uh, stems from the conversation you had with Dr. Joseph Peterson. Man, wasn't that a good wasn't that a good interview? He says, what other animals extant that we can uh, observe have similar pathologies? Whoa. 
like do the xenotherans and xenotherans are animals like um armadillos sloth uh what else anteaters i think they're all part of that that group um said um do they show pathologies like infected digging claws whoa do walruses um get infections in and around their tusks do elephants how prone are woodpeckers to uh contusional stress fractures wow giraffes and pronghorns wow really his he says really my question is do animals that have special features like for instance claws tusks horns beaks are they prone to infection when using the features as designed? Thank you so much and God bless. Oh, man, Kenny, do I wish that this is a question I would have thought of or I wish I would have read prior to that interview because what a great question to ask someone whose life uh, is focused on these sorts of things. I will say this, um, boy, you know, if I can get Dr. Peterson back on, um, I would love to ask him this stuff. Maybe I'll try to email him or maybe try to find him on Facebook. I know he has a Facebook presence. Um, man, I don't know the answer to it. Uh, Kenny, that's the biggest problem is I do not know the answer to this. Uh, I just don't know, man, man, do I wish I, I would have gotten this question. What a brilliant one. Well, you know, Kenny, I apologize for not being able to answer the question for you, but it is brilliant. All right. Next is George from San Francisco, California. Now, George, you spell it with a J, so I'm going to make the assumption you prefer uh, Jorge, um, and that's the the way most people pronounce it. If it starts with a day, J. If not, I apologize, but I'm going to call you Jorge only because that here in San Antonio, when somebody spells it with a J, that's usually the preferred um, pronunciation. So Jorge says, "Great pad- podcast on Pachycephalus ortho." Doctor Peterson, another good comment about Doctor Peterson's. Uh, podcast interview he says but i do have a question that didn't come up oh man oh hey i feel bad enough that kenny brought up some i should have asked as an interviewer can't believe i didn't so let's see what he wants to say all of the modern examples peterson brought up of headbutting ma'am uh headbutting uh mammals are quadrupedal but pachycephalosaurus was bipedal bipedal how would the physics of the body and the animal's locomotion have affected head or body budding behavior, if at all? Would they have balanced issues? Wow. Could they even get a similar amount of leverage in their strikes as the modern quadruped examples? Brilliant question. Jorge, my gosh, you and Ken, I ought to, uh, ought to hire you two to come in and start doing these interviews because these are questions that I should have asked because they're brilliant. Okay. With Pachycephalosaurus, one of the benefits for him, and we talked about a little bit, is about where the neck connects to the skull. It's not the same as other dinosaurs, and I believe that was an evolutionary process to help them with their balance. How it worked, I don't know, but since they're the only dinosaurs to have that sort of connection, then it would lend itself to think that it has a function other than the function of other dinosaurs. So I believe right away to offset that problem you bring up about if you're on all fours, it's easier to, to, to stay balanced when you're butting heads. But if you're standing on two legs, is it that easy? So I think first of all, the connection in the back of the skull would have been a factor in helping that. I say this from simply a, a position of, I think not because I've had the chance to study it, but that's what I think. Second of all, uh, Dr. Peterson brought up an interesting brought up an interesting comment about perhaps they're not butting heads ramming. Perhaps they are standing side to side like the way giraffes fight and they're swinging their head out and into the sides of the flank of the animal. And therefore, the stability is not as big a deal because you have that long tail and that head, the front and half part of your body is balanced. So maybe if you splay your legs out a little bit and you ram that head into the side of the guy, it doesn't require you to have the sense of balance that you rec- recognize that quadrupeds would have. That's my best guess, uh, Jorge or George, whichever you prefer. Both very good questions from both you and Kenny. Uh, I just wish I was better able to to answer them, but they're brilliant. All right, um, Erin from... Erlingen, Germany. Hey, DG, here's my question. First of all, Erin, I hope I pronounced your name right. E-R-E-N, Erin, Erin. Perhaps it's Erin. See here, 
uh, people named Aaron here often spell it with an A, so that's why I pronounce it Aaron. But with you, it's it's written with an E. I'm wondering if it's Aaron. But if it if it's pronounced Aaron, please accept my apologies for everybody out there. I'm the world's worst at phonics. Oh, I'm horrible, man. I'm absolutely horrible. So I butcher stuff all the time. Okay, here is Aaron's question. In the documentary Dinosaur Planet that was done in 2001, Carcharodontosaurus is shown living in South America 80 to 85 million years ago. Is there any evidence to support this? Thank you for answering my questions, and I hope you're doing well. Thank you, Aaron. I hope you and your family and all of your friends are doing well as well. It's very polite of you. Uh, I didn't see the documentary so I saw parts of it I can remember, but that was so long ago. Maybe I did, but I may have missed the part about Carcharodontosaurus because if they're saying Carcharodontosaurus is living in South America, I am unaware of any evidence to support that. Now, there were certainly uh, similar dinosaurs uh, that were living in South America that have that those blade-like teeth. You know, you look at uh, Giganotosaurus and Maposaurus, they have those blade-like Carcharodontidish teeth. So... Um, maybe there were very close relatives, but to my understanding, I do not believe Carcharodontosaurus, that particular species, is was living in South America. All right, this is from Alexander. Hello, Mr. Blassing. Hey, Alexander. Always call me George, DG, Dinosaur George, whatever you prefer. I, I am very, very flattered that anyone has that sort of, uh, of um, uh, politeness, and that's very kind of you, but Always feel free to call me George or whatever you want. Uh, well, not whatever you want. I got to be careful. I know a lot of you personally. I know what you'd like to call me. <laughs> All right. Alexander said, hope you're doing well and don't let don't let Christmas stress you out. Oh, brother, that is a stressful time of year for, I think, almost everyone. Christmas is so stressful. You know, when I was a kid, we would get things that Christmas was like the only time of year that in your birthday that you got gifts. So Anything you got was like the greatest thing in the world. Well, now that's not really the case. And so a lot of people get stuff year round all the time and a lot of things. And so Christmas is stressful for two reasons. One, you feel an obligation to get things for people, even if you know they don't really need anything. That's a little stressful. Second, it's like, what can you give that doesn't make it look so cheesy compared to what they've gotten all throughout the entire year? It's a stressful time. I'm glad I don't have kids. I've got a niece and nephews, but they're they're all grown up. So so it's not you know, it's not as difficult. But boy, I don't know how parents do it today. All right. My question for today, in your opinion, did any dinosaurs have a sliced tongue like a snake or a Komodo dragon. I mean, dinosaurs like Herrerasaurus, Concavenator, and Eustreptospondylus, i.e. mid-sized ones. Okay, that split, a sliced tongue, what you're referring to is a forked tongue, the, the tongue like what you see on lizards that have the, the are snakes have that forked in. All right, those features are designed to assist the reptiles to taste the air. It's how they smell, basically, how they taste the air dinosaurs olfactory systems in their skulls after looking at all of the uh all of the uh ct scans the cat scans of the skulls i don't believe it was necessary to have that feature because their sense of smell from everything i've seen seems to be quite good now some of the smaller or mid-sized ones i don't think it would make a difference i don't think size would have any impact on this I don't think they need it, Alexander. I think they do perfectly well without it. we will tell you something, though. I did talk about uh, one time uh, in an interview about Tylosaurus, whether Mosasaurs, because Mosasaurs are more like snakes than dinosaurs. Dinosaurs are not really reptilian-ish. They're not really like lizards and snakes in much that you see on them. So I don't really think of them as being as reptilian as I do birdish or dinosaurs. But uh, he brought up a point about uh, Mosasaurs. Maybe Mosasaurs had that forked tongue. Whatever it is, it'd be really cool. All right, Alan from Chesham, England. Hi, DG. Hey, Alan. I know your favorite dinosaur is Allosaurus, but I was wondering what is your favorite herbivorous dinosaur? And I was also wondering what your favorite carnivorous and herbivorous prehistoric mammals are. Then he says, cheers, Alan. Alan, thank you, buddy. Uh, wow. Okay. 
wow, what do I choose as my favorite herbivorous dinosaur? See, over the years, I've really fallen in love with the ankylosaurs. Uh, Gastonia, I like a lot. Um, Cycania, I like a lot. So many ankylosaurs. But then you see these cool ceratopsians. I guess I'm going to go to what has remained my favorite herbivore, and that is Styracosaurus. I just think he's so cool. So I got to pick Styracosaurus, even though some of those ankylosaurs are making their way up. Now, as for mammals, wow. Carnivorous mammals. Oh, geez. What do I like the best? It's so hard to pick. It's like asking somebody who their favorite kid is. Um, I know in my parents' situation, I was their favorite kid. My other brothers and sisters were irrelevant. And with good reason, because I am so sar- so far superior to those those uh, those other people. <laughs> so, um, who do I pick? Okay, carnivores. I can't narrow it down to a specific species, but I like the dogs. I like the dogs. I like bears. I like entelodonts. I like the saber-toothed cats. But boy. I like the dogs, so I'm just going to go with some of the prehistoric dogs. Maybe of all of them, Dino Crocuda. Yeah, now he's not a dog; he's more like a like a uh, hyena. But still, I, I I'm guess I'm going to say Dino Crocuda. Now, when you get into the mammals, I really like Servalsus, the giant deer slash moose. <laughs> I don't know why, but I like Servalsus a lot. So those would be my choices. What a great question. All right, Jeffrey from Fremont, California. Hello, DG. What Studio Ghibli movies are your favorite? Sorry, no dino question this time. (laughs) Jeffrey, it's all right. You don't always have to ask dinosaur questions on this show. You can ask anything. Uh, Ghibli, those are the guys that do the the anime movies, right? Uh, I will say up front... I, I don't watch a lot of anime. I, I'm not, it's not that I don't like it. I just don't, I just don't have the time really. The only anime movie I've ever watched part of was Spirit, Spirit Away, Spirit, Spirited Away, Spirits Away or Spirited Away, something away. I just remember that. I don't know who made that, but that's one of the few anime movies that I, that I, watch quite a bit of but i'm so sorry i just don't i just don't know uh i just don't know who uh, uh who these guys are as far as what they what kind of movies they make sorry buddy but ask me anything you want anytime jeffrey all right reed from thief river falls minnesota i love that that town thief river falls what a cool place hey dg hey reed i was wondering if you could tell me what dinosaurs could have lived in minnesota Ooh. um i know uh why th- I know why there aren't many species of dinosaurs found in Minnesota because of the glaciers during the ice age, but I know that there was a large species of raptor discovered here. And I think it could have been Dakota raptor, but what do you think? Okay. Um, Reed, one of the things with Minnesota is that, uh, the formations that they find dinosaurs in are not as common there. Um, and so you don't get a chance to find that much, but I do know there is a formation don't remember the name of it, but there is a formation that is exposed somewhere in Minnesota because you're right. They found what appears to be uh, some bones from uh Dromaeosaurid. I also think they found Truodon, uh, some sort of ankylosaur and some sort of hadrosaur. Dinosaurs are there. They're absolutely there, Reed. The problem is layers of dirt are like pages in a book. And as you go down that book, you're going deeper into the ground, basically. In order to find dinosaurs, you have to get to that one certain page that represents the age of dinosaurs. And to get to that page, you either have to dig or you have to let erosion carry away the dirt layers on top. So the best place to find dinosaur bones is places where erosion has done the majority of the excavation and therefore it's easier to see them therefore more things are found when you have to dig or you don't have a lot of those exposed layers then your chances of finding a dinosaur are very poor so i do know dinosaurs have been found in minnesota i can't tell you species but i do know there have been fun uh, some all right finally 
Last one. Uh, this is from, I think it's pronounced Arya. It's A-R-Y-A. Arya from, oh, should I even try to pronounce this? Uh, it's it's from uh, Andhra Pradesh in India. But the name of the town is, I'm going to try it. Vis, Visaha. I'm not even going to try it. I'm going to spell it. V-I-S-A-K-H-A-P-A-T-N-A-M. Oh, man, I butchered it. Visapatnam. Visapatnam. Oh, I do not know how to pronounce it. I'm so sorry. Please apologize to every person in India for my inability to pronounce the name. I am so I am so sorry. Uh, and Arya, and I'm guessing Arya is how you pronounce your name. Uh, I, I I hope you uh, accept my sincere apologies. I, I truly just can't pronounce it. I'm terrible at that stuff. Okay, so Arya says, hey, George, I hope you're having a good day. I am. I am very much so. Um, he writes, I'm just a kid in India. Hey, you're not just a kid. You're somebody that likes dinosaurs and somebody that took the time to write to me. Uh, so you're not just a kid. You're a very fine young person. Um, here's my question. Why did Crylophosaurus have a crest? Sincerely, your biggest fan. That's very kind of you. Why did it have a crest? You know, that crest is too thin to be used for anything other than display, meaning that it is you you wouldn't be able to um you wouldn't be able to fight with it you wouldn't be able to use it as a weapon it's only going to serve the purpose of um of uh, uh display and what i mean by that is things like uh showing off uh you know showing off to females or you know recognition maybe for animals other animals of the same species to recognize who you are. All right, everybody, listen, I have enjoyed answering your questions. Go to my website, dinosaurgeorge.com. Click on the contact us button and then look at the drop down menu where it says Ask Dinosaur George. That is where you submit your questions. You can also go to my podcast, which is podcast.dinosaurgeorge.com, or you can see a link on my website to it and you can post questions and comments there as well on the podcast. For everybody, I hope you think of us when you think of the holiday season coming up. If you would like to get some cool replicas, I hope you'll consider visiting the store. That address is store.dinosaurgeorge.com. Coming up on a future episode, it looks like I'm going to be able to interview the president of the Vertebrate Paleontology Society, the biggest society dedicated to paleontology in the world. It's where all of the major paleontologists are associated with it. So I'm very excited about that. So stay tuned. If I can if I can get that interview, uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. It's going to be fun uh, if I get a chance to, to get the interview done. Uh, everybody out there, take care of yourselves. Take care of the people around you. For those of you that are watching on YouTube, I would appreciate if you like and, and subscribe and share with your friends. And for everybody who's listening on the podcast, I hope you'll share it with your friends as well. The more people we can get on, the better it will be and the more likely I can dedicate more time to doing this. Eh, the weather's great here and I think I'm going to go outside and get a little work done out in the shop. So for everybody again, I appreciate you listening and sticking with me through all these years and asking me the great questions. And again, to all of the country of India, I am apologetic for not being able to pronounce the name, but maybe I'll figure it out and do a better job. Thank you guys so much. Take care, everybody. Take care of the people around you, and I will see you all soon. Okay? Thank you for listening to the Dinosaur George Show. Please follow us on our social media links and join our mailing list. If you're interested in having Dinosaur George speak at your event, please visit our website at dinosaurgeorge.com. Until next time, keep digging for clues about the past. 